Good morning, Stronghold family. How are you? I'm Charvon, and I am here to do your morning announcements. Now, I know you guys are used for me to make announcements in regards to the youth ministry, but not today. They'll come later. So now let's start. Baptismal will take place outside in the parking lot today at 5 p.m. Please bring your lawn chairs and we will have free water ice and pretzels. The parking lot will need to be cleared directly following the 11.45 a.m. worship service. So please make sure you remove your vehicles from the church parking lot. Now volunteers are needed for setup and breakdown. Also, please join us this week for our pastor's Wednesday night Bible study starting at 6.30 p.m. This week is Mission Week. We will hear from the following groups, Ambassadors Fellowship, Child Evangelism Fellowship, and Pam Moza. So please come out and join us. The Comforters Ministry invites you to join their ministry event on this Tuesday, August the 6th at 7 p.m. The topic is the spiritual elements of grief and healing. It will be in person here in the fellowship hall as well as on Zoom. Please see last week's update for the Zoom link and other details. Now, the next Bible study book is entitled Characters, Volume 3, The Kings, and will begin Wednesday, August the 7th. The book is available for purchase from the church office. The cost is ten dollars now the church family gathering is going to be saturday august the 31st from 10 a.m to 6 p.m the location is belmont grove that's 2010 belmont mansion drive the cost is free so now please register on rim or in the church office now what you need to bring is your own food your own grill your own chairs, your own table, and your own tent if you need it, and anything else you might need. Now join us for free water ice, a grill off, three point contest, Uno, phase 10 tournament, and some other activities they're gonna have for us. But now this coming fall, the classes at the Christian Resources and Development Training Institute will begin on Monday, September the 9th. Don't miss this opportunity to deepen your spiritual growth, learn practical life skills, and support others. Classes will be held via Zoom. Begin your journey to personal and spiritual renewal. Register today at www.c rdonline.org or call the church at 215-877-1530. That's it for me, but before I turn it back to the worship leader, check out this promo video. Have a blessed day! This is Pastor Taylor. The Ten Commandments were given to Moses to deliver to the children of Israel. You see, they had spent about 430 years in Egypt, and they had learned how to love other gods. And the Ten Commandments, in reality, which is one of the most misinterpreted verses in the Bible, was really meant not to hammer people with the law, but it was really meant to explain and to teach the nation of Israel that they, how they should love God and how they should love others. You see, as this verse is misinterpreted, our sin nature is actually prone to cheat on God. In other words, we put other things and other people in place where God belongs and we worship them. But I want to show you through uh, these first two commandments in Exodus chapter 20, how God actually has a love language and that there is a way that God teaches us how to love him. You see, in the 70s, 
there was a R&B song that was written, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. It's about a man who was having an affair with another woman while he had a wife and family at home. God is saying, I want you to love me because you are married to me and I'm married to you. On August the 4th, I can't wait to share with you through this book of the Bible, Greater Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, how to love God. Because if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. Good evening, church family. My name is Reverend Robert Rome. I will be speaking from the theme for the month of August, the Ten Commandments. My assignment is to unpack Exodus 20, verse 7, that states, Thou shalt not use the, God, use the Lord thy God's name in vain. This verse will lead us into a way of life that honors God and keeps his name with total reverence. Join me on August the 4th, second service, as we learn how to respect the name of God and keep it holy. See you there. Hey, Chris and Stronghold, Reverend Demond White. Now, through the month of August, as you know, we've been charged to preach through the Ten Commandments. Now, I have the pleasure of being presented with the Fourth Commandment, that is, to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, the Sabbath itself is very controversial, whether it's within Orthodox Christianity or whether it's outside of Christianity with groups like Seventh-day Adventists who believe that the Sabbath is on a Saturday. Now, if you join me, we can delve through the scriptures and see what God has to say about the controversies. Now, will we be able to deal with every single controversy? No, but what we can do is find out what God has to say about it and how it affects us now as Christians today. So join me on Communion Sunday at five o'clock as I shall present the fourth commandment to you to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. him one more time to be still and know that he is God something to be said about living in the stillness and the nothingness when you realize you ain't got nothing you can do on your own you bring nothing to the game you didn't even show with a ball he brought the court the ball the basket the talent the gift the coach and the bench he he the water boy and the captain 
to be still. So thankful for the opportunity to spend some time with you and thankful for uh, Pastor Bell. Y'all continue to pray for him and Sister Renee as they're on vacation. Amen. Pray that they get a great rest and come back uh, ready to go charging into the fall. Amen. Um, I also pray that you would um, continue to pray for Nicole. She's with us this morning. I'm excited to have her here. But if we're honest, the journey is getting a little more challenging. So you keep praying for her, that God would bless her. And he may be the God who heals. The great news is my wife doesn't need deliverance. She just needs healing. And that's a guarantee. She's going to get healed. It, it, it may not heal. may not be when I want it to, but joy cometh in the morning. Don't anybody get it twisted. I know what God's about. Hey, hey, wait on him, I say. Be of good spirit. Amen. But she's here today, and we're thankful for that. And for all my kids who helped me so much, I bless God for them. I want to start a little different today. We want to pray, but I'm going to ask if any of you feel called, would you come meet me at the altar? I want us to kneel in a moment of prayer. Would you begin, or if you feel it, you come on. You don't have to, but I want us to start differently today. Eternal God, as we come to you, we are still to know that you are God. We come with a desire to have hearts that are open and minds that are tender towards your word. Would you empty us all of ourselves that we might glorify you in this activity, which is the gathering of the church, of the very body of Christ. Would you make us a bride, beautified by you, O God? Would you bless the words of my mouth that they might be, Lord, a concentration and a focus on what you would have us to know and to see and understand? Would you make this discipleship not just a thing we do, but a way of life? We cry out to you, O Abba God, that you would complete us and make us better than when we walk through the doors that they glorify yourself as only you can. Open, O God, the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on us today that we might hear a word from you. We ask it in that matchless name of Jesus. We declare him to be the Christ church. Amen. 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 I asked us to start there today because um, I believe that this idea of discipleship being a way of life requires a level of us to say to ourselves, be honest with ourselves, to humble ourselves and say, maybe sometimes we don't get it all right. Maybe as great as we are as a church, and we are a phenomenal church, extraordinary body of people. You give and you're faithful and you serve and we call upon you, to, that's great. But I never want us to confuse the things we do with the way of life. Because things we do are just that. Many shall say on that day, Lord, Lord, did I not? The things you do don't mean so much. So I'm going to talk about discipleship. Now, when I say this, listen, make sure you clear your mind. I'm not talking about the process of discipleship we go through. Those are excellent. I'm not talking about mighty men and women of grace or um, um, what's women's discipleship called? Pearls of Grace, but no, it wasn't the old one. It was that too. It was all. We still got all of the disciples, you know. But all of those are the, those are all ways in which we, as a church, try to fulfill the Great Commission. But today I'm talking about something different: how we, as individuals, choose to live our lives. That idea of a way of life. How many of y'all remember a way of life? We used to call evangelism a way of life, which was you. You know, that's where you took evangelism with you everywhere you went. You had your little four spiritual law and your glory and honor track. You had your blue book and you was on septum. and you was waiting for the Holy Spirit to say, got one. You was out there, I'm going to be a fisher of men today, got one. You would practice. Y'all know y'all were practice. Some of y'all had 17 different tracks for the moment that y'all would get. The one y'all knew, y'all knew, I got a track for this one. Y'all had the dollar bill track, the making Jesus King track. Y'all had it all. 
It was a way of life. I can remember riding the Broad Street line, me and Cynthia Hayward, then Cynthia Jones. And we'd be looking, who we gonna get? Because here y'all are on a Sunday afternoon, early in the morning, going to church. Y'all ain't supposed to, y'all supposed to be, you know, hung over or something, no. We just cleaned up and had our Vaseline on our faces and everything. <laughs> we were right, way of life. Dare I say to you, I think discipleship is meant to be a way of life, a calling that God has on us that we might fulfill his mission. Turn with me to Matthew, the 28th chapter, the 16th to the 20th verse. You read it, I believe, earlier, but then it says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Say that, worshiped him. Worship him. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You all know the Great Commission. I know you know it. It is essentially guys casting a vision statement, a call, a mission, and he's in essentially placing that on all of our hearts and asking us to now go do this work of being duplicative, of being regenerative, of being and creating disciples. But sometimes we might get it a little wrong. We may think the act of having been discipled is the completion of discipleship. That's the thing we do. What Jesus is telling them is make it a way of life. Everywhere you go, everything you impart, you've got to be being discipled and discipling. The real evidence of discipleship is when you see yourself in someone else and actually what you see is Jesus in them as a result of you engaging with them. They are now discipling. That is the regenerative practice of discipleship. That's why it's called to be in a mission until the day he comes, until here he comes riding on a cloud. You're supposed to be discipling and being discipled. I think the challenge for the church today is that sometimes we become a little more isolated, a little more distant. We've checked the box on our spiritual maturity. We don't think we need a lot of advice anymore. And I'm not just talking to young people who don't think they need the advice of older people. I'm talking to older people who don't think they need the advice of the person sitting next to them. You don't need no counseling. You don't need no more. You done. I'm a disciple. No. Discipleship is a way of life, a desire to eagerly want to see more of God. And as you go through life to get more and more of him, you know you're going to need the advice and structure and support of people who are not always you. Looking at the man in the mirror may work for Michael Jackson, but it don't work for you. So I'm going to ask you over and over again throughout this time to ask yourself a critical question. Is discipleship a way of life or is it a thing we do? Can you say that with me? Is discipleship, one, two, three. Is it a way of life or a thing we do? There's a great little illustration that you'll see up on the screen where we talk about, he says, baptize, teach, and make disciples. Baptize, teach, and make disciples. Baptize, teach. That rotation, that idea, wraps itself around this idea of loving, learning, and leading. Say that, loving, loving. Learning, learning, and leading. Now, I'm going to terrify you because I've got a seven-point sermon that bumps up into these three big categories. I won't take all day, I promise. Y'all will not be here till baptism. We're going to go through these quickly. No questions, please. We're going to go through these quickly. But if I want you to think about it, I want you to categorize them this way. Discipleship, in the end, if you're going to make it a way of life, you're going to have to evaluate the way you're loving in this world, the way you're learning, and then the way you're leading. 
And inside of those, there's going to be two things about loving, there's going to be three things about learning, and there's going to be two things about leading. So all y'all note takers, we're the note takers in the house. Y'all still in it? Amen. 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 The rest of y'all not taking notes, your, your hand's going to get weak. I just want you to know. <laughs> Loving, learning, leading, and wrapped around that is this command to baptize, teach, and make disciples. To baptize, teach, and make disciples. They put up on the screen for you these three categories. Let me give them to you real quick. When we talk about love, we're going to talk about this idea of worshiping and loving God. You just heard Pastor Taylor talk about that. You're going into the Ten Commandments. It's about how you love God and how you love one another. That's why it's such an odd name, Summer Love. They're like, Summer Love, Ten Commandments, what's that about? But as they unpack it, I think it'll become all the more clear that you may come through the summer and fall in love with God in a new and living way as a result of going through the Ten Commandments. Learning, learning to have faith in God, learning to share your faith in God, and then learning to study your faith. Oh, Mark. These are what you might consider marks of discipleship. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is to look at these areas and say, do I see the marks of discipleship in my life? If I do, then that's great. If I don't, then maybe there's an area where I see an opportunity to improve, and it might be in how I worship God and how I prepare for worship. It may be in how I worship or love others. So my loving God, that may be areas, or maybe that, hey, I understand my faith, but I don't have faith right now. I got some things going on in my life, and my faith is becoming a little weaning and distant, and maybe it's getting a little quiet, and I can't see God the way I used to. God is saying, but draw near to me. Humble yourself before my mighty hand. He's saying that I will strengthen you in your weakness. There I made perfect. And so he's calling you into a deeper faith. We're going to talk about disciple and being discipled and making disciples. Let's talk about this idea of worship. How many of y'all know worship is a verb? Yes. Worship is a verb. It is an action word. It is not a thing you observe. So this may feel like it's worship, but sitting and observing is not worship. Worship is an action word. That's a great book called Worship is a Verb by this guy, Robert E. Weber. It says, worship is a verb behind every major activity of the church. From evangelism to healing, there must be worship. Worship declares who glory it really is. Without worship, you might actually get confused and think you did it. You did that event. That was your carnival. It was your ministry. <laughs> you better take your name off that thing. <laughs> Worship requires you recognize. All things come from thee, O oh God. Not just your money, your talent, your treasure, your gifting. If you take the next breath as a gift of God, you better worship him. Worship is a verb. When it says in that passage in Matthew, it says that they, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, the mountain where Jesus told them, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. It is the literal like running up and grabbing at his feet. We have this little English bulldog named Rudy. Now, when I walk through the door, Rudy, now listen, I'm sure Rudy's not my favorite person, not, he meant, but Rudy come running to the door to see us. Worship is an eagerness for God, a desire to be where he is because of who he is. It's this action that can, and he's saying, you're going to have, that's what they, they saw him and they worshiped him. But two minutes later it says, and some doubted. Not everybody today showed up to worship him. You got to ask yourself that question. Did you come with an eagerness for God? Or was it a duty to get up? Drag yourself out. Got to check that box. Because my lotto might come in this week. I, Lord, help, I know. I, stop it. Not up in here, Pastor. Not up in here. Not up in here. 
I need a better grade on that quiz. Not up there. I know y'all didn't come with that. God ain't no good luck charm. I know that's not the case. But just in case, it says some came and they worshiped him. They were fleeing. One of the, they kissed his feet and grabbed his hands. They were clinging on to him. And yet at that same moment, some doubted. Mark 12, 31 and 30 to 31 states, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And other passage says that on this, both the law and the prophets, that's where they stop. This is the commandment. Love God and love one another. So the demonstration of the love of God is to worship him, to give him all credit and all honor for all that he has done. And then from there, it should compel us to love one another. He said, what does this have to do with discipleship? For some of you, as you engage in ministry, you run into people that you don't really love. I know that's not the case. I know. I know it ain't the case. Not, but just in case, hypothetically, there might be someone who you run into in ministry that you kind of get to the place where loving them is a little more challenging than you want. And God is saying, those are the moments of discipleship. Let me give you a step further. Sometimes you're leading people. It's not that you don't love them, but they take a little more work than you want. You're raising people, and they take a little more work than you like. You work next to them, and they take a little more. And God is saying, don't you know that that's the moment of discipleship? Not only I am sending you everywhere, and lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth is your cubicle, and the person sitting next to you. Now that you got to go back to work, Mayor Sherelle Parker says. <laughs> don't be mad. She said, you got to come to work. But now that they're saying... Blue Cross, Blue Shield, all these companies, you got to come back in. You can't sit at home distant from God's sacrifice. You got to get now right back where you were, a little closer to the job. And there it is closer to the calling. And there in the calling might be a moment where God is saying, make a disciple. Woo! Make a disciple. Now, you may say, well, they don't want me to, listen, I just want to make sure you understand what it took to make you a disciple. He went to the cross. They stretched him high and hung him out, stripped him naked, and there it was. Oh, precious is the flow. Well, how precious is it? Will you, is it precious enough? To make you say, I'm going to make a sacrifice to that one that I don't really care so much about. In my ministry, in my home, in my job, at wherever I am. Am I willing to say, stretch me out. Nail me to that cross. Make a disciple. Love God. Love others. Love God in your demonstration of worship, a desire and an eagerness to get to where he is. And listen, you may say, Pastor, I don't have it. Like, I don't have this yet. He hasn't. Can I tell you this? It is in serving that you, do, you find yourself to the place where you're willing to worship. It's in that sacrifice of yourself that you actually find the pleasure of God. So one of the reasons that you might not feel so close to God is because you're not really at the place where you made a decision. See, some worship and some doubted. They weren't really sure he was who he said he was. Here he stands in this glorified, re resurrected body. Put your fingers in my palm. Put your hand in my side, but he's not yet at the place. Some doubted. So if you're at that place of doubt, then the day might be the day where you say to yourself, you know, I got to really yield my life to God. Worship him. So the question on the screen is this. Is loving God and others a way of life or a thing we do?
We're going to read that together. Y'all ready? One, two, three. So we talked about loving. Now we're going to talk about learning. Learning, learning, learning. James 1, 2, and 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you are met with trials in various kinds. For know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be what? Perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Say, I got to learn my faith. See, listen. It's this idea, go teach and learn, right? So, so when I say this idea of learning, it's to say, he, the, the word is uh, matheteo. It is this idea of being a scholar of the faith. So we're going to talk about in this whole section of learning, how, do, are, how are you doing to this idea of being a scholar of the faith? Now, one of the first steps in that day is to say that, listen, I got to make this faith me. As we go through trials and our biggest challenges, we get to know God. It says, listen, for know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. How is this idea of testing of my faith going to make me somehow deeper, more, more? The idea of knowing is to be, it's a, this, this idea to be able to perceive and have a knowledge of what it means to trust in God. So when you go through your most challenging seasons, your most difficult moments, you may be looking at them and saying, God, why are you putting me through this? And God is saying, don't you understand? I'm testing you so that you might become steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the grace of God. I'm testing you so that you might be strengthened because in your weakness, there I am made. I'm testing you not just for my glory, but that you might arrive at the place. Anybody ever been through something that when you were going through, you're like, oh, I hate this. But when you look back over your life, yeah. like, like Jeremiah says, I can see great is your faithfulness. Your mercy's been new to me morning after morning. You may be in the midst of the storm. Don't worry about it. Like Pastor said, be like a buffalo. Go running into the storm that you might understand, God, why? What do you want from me? What are you doing? With my faith has to be learned to be deepened, to be strengthened. It's like a deep water. Let it be drawn out of you. <clears throat> the Peter who shows up in the book of Acts ain't the same Peter who ran from the cross. <clears throat> that ain't the same Peter. The testing of his faith made him steadfast gave him knowledge and understanding so that when the shipwrecks came and a persecution came, when thousands were standing before him, he could preach a word of God and they were, that's why you got to learn to have faith. Second thing you got to do is you got to learn to share your faith. You got to learn to share your faith. I asked a group of people this question about sharing the faith. And of all the things people struggle with, this is one. <clears throat> people struggle with this. I am sure there are people who come, got saved, and never yet come to the place where they're capable of sharing their faith. There's a fear there. That's the enemy. That's the enemy. 2 Corinthians 5.20. We, therefore, are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. This idea of ambassadorship in the early church would have been essentially like a council for the Roman. They would have understood this to mean I had authority, that I was the knowledgeable one. When you go to share your faith, it's not necessarily about you being so great. God has identified you as being more knowledgeable than the person that you're sharing your faith with. What's your knowledge? My knowledge is of Jesus Christ. What am I sharing? Maybe you can't share the four sports and laws, but all, if all you can share is, listen, my name is Keith Bethel. And when I was 23 years old, I walked in this church at Christian Stronghold trying to date a young woman. And before you know it, as I listened to the word of God, he imparted something in me. I found myself giving my life to him. Now some 30 some odd years later, I still walk with him. That might be all I get to tell him. So would you come to church? Because maybe he's going to do the same thing he did for you for me. 
That may be all I got. Some of you got more than that. You got the gift of evangelism. Some of you can wax eloquently the Romans road. You can take them through the depths and the arguments. You got an apologetic. That's great. You got a calling. We got a ministry for you. Come on. But don't get through life without recognizing God calls you to share your faith. Now listen, I want to challenge you. This is what the Hebrews 5, 12 to 14 says this. In fact, though, by this time, you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk is being still an infant. Somebody say, grow up. Grow up. Huh? <laughs> grow up. Not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness, but solid food. Is for the mature, the King James, I think, says spiritually mature, who by constant use or constant application have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. <clears throat> Part of sharing your faith is living a life that reflects it. So it's hard to share your faith if your life look a little muddy. It's hard to say, yeah. If you were to slide up a little bit in that 2 Corinthians passage, if you have your Bible, slide up to the verse 15 verse. Because it'll, it'll explain why that 2 Corinthians 20 sticks out. <clears throat> For Christ's love compels us. This is 2 Corinthians 5, 15. For Christ's love compels us that because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all die, he died for all that those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Here's the verse. So from now on, regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once you regarded Christ in this way, we do that no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. It's going to go, and y'all know that. This idea of regard no one, it doesn't matter what they look like. Doesn't matter who they're going to vote for. I like that donkey, elephant, lamb thing. I'm going to use that one. It doesn't matter what they look like. Doesn't matter what they smell like. Doesn't matter what color of skin, how short or how tall. They can have their head covered. He says, I regard no one as if they're not someone I can share my faith with. I regard no discipleship. If you go, it's a part of this is your ability to actually share your faith, to call people out who God brings you into contact with, your sphere of influence, your oikos, your calling. That is a part of this call to be disciples of God. And so listen, so many of you find that you may interact with people that you just let it go because they don't look like us. I was in New Orleans this week, and I love jazz, so I'm sitting at a jazz place after we had meetings, I went, I'm sitting there, and there's a person sitting next to me, I'm thinking, hmm, this isn't a person I would ever. Like, it's not the first, like, we're just not, in fact, she was getting on my nerves a little bit, kind of just a little too loud in a jazz place. All y'all jazz fans, y'all know y'all don't really like people who go to jazz clubs who really don't like jazz, they just there for the vibe. <laughs> You're like, no, I'm trying to, you know, and, you know, but now the great thing for me is this. I kind of have a job title that makes it easy for me to start the conversation because people are like, what do you do? <laughs> I'm a pastor. <laughs> now, one or two things are going to happen. They're going to shut down, turn their chair, go the other way, or they're going to begin... Doesn't matter what they look like or sound like or whatnot. God creates these divine and moments in inner, and when there's an opportunity to say, then you must begin to use your life in such a way. That's what discipleship is all about. And so if you're at the place where you say, listen, I've learned to have deeper faith, but I'm not yet yearning to share my faith, then that's one of those things. It's a mark of discipleship. Don't show up to heaven having never been able to give testimony. But God, there was someone I told about you. Has he done great things for you? I mean, is he, is he worthy of being glorified and blessed for who he is? That he waken, not just that he woke us up, but he's given us life and purpose. He's worthy of, so then why not take a moment today, tomorrow, next week, to brag on him? You brag on them kids? 
I brag on my kids. I don't tell them, but I brag on them. And they all right. But Jesus got, listen, I, if I can brag on them, then can I take a minute to brag on him? Learn to reconcile others to Christ. Then you got to learn to study the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things which you have heard me say, and the presence of many witnesses, and trust those are reliable people who are able, who are also qualified to teach others. This idea that we've got to learn and study the faith, it matters. You can't just act like this. No, no, we got to study this thing. This thing is life. And if, listen, if you give it a chance, it's got wings. It'll take off and take you places you never thought you were able to go. Some of y'all did missions trips this year. Y'all ain't know nothing about Y'all wasn't even trying, but God calls you to a new thing, a deeper walk, a deeper faith in them. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who need a night be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Are you studying the word anymore? Hey, I want my pro presenter team. Can y'all jump a couple slides forward? I'm going to come back to that one slide, but jump forward to that stuff around right now media for me, please. Love y'all. Thank you. So, so, so many of y'all signed. How many of y'all on right now media now? I know y'all are. There's about 640 or 660 of y'all, 630 is on the screen, are already on right now media. That's that free app. It's in the hall where you can scan it. There's tons of material on there. There's the Christian Stronghold Clinic that was got stuff that we as the district pastors and Pastor Bell have identified, and you are taking off. Go to the next slide for them. Look. Y'all went from that little low bar, that was first, y'all started, I tell y'all, y'all good. Give yourselves a clap, come on now. Y'all went, y'all started 61,000 minutes, 4,700 visits, y'all are rocking and rolling. 630 of you. But there's about 1,800 adults in this church, another five or 600 children and young adults and you, so we got room. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need to not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I ain't got to make that up. So listen, go to that site, check it out, but go and learn a little more. Study the faith. Why? Because in those moments of discipleship, you're going to need that lesson that you learn, that you can call upon and take them back to. You're going to need to understand what Ruth and Naomi are really all about. This. You're going to need to know what Gen You can study the Ten Commandments while, you're there, while they're preaching the Ten Commandments. So you can check them out. They got that right? <laughs> study the Word of God. Because a mark of discipleship is this ongoing study. Hebrews says, Hebrews says, consecrate me to a new and living way. You've got to learn the Word of God. Memorize the Word of God. Make it a deep seed planted inside of you so that when that moment where God is saying, not only is it time for you to be disciple, but you're going to be the discipler. Not because of any group or anything, no, because he engaged you with a person who you will walk with them for the rest of their lives. How many of you know, still know your disciples? <clears throat> yeah. When last time you had dinner with them? Now, my, di my disciple went on to be with the Lord, so I've got to wait to have our next dinner date. But people like Jerry Metley and Ernest Washington, and I'm gonna mess y'all up right now. Don't think that discipleship is always about men with men and women with women. I know I'm gonna scare y'all, I'm terrifying y'all. Hold on for a second. How many of y'all would say Marvel Washington was a part of your discipleship journey? Yeah, because if you've ever been on a missions trip and the Great Commission is mission, she impacted you. Knowledge and wisdom comes from counselors and others, being able to receive and accept knowledge from those who know more than you. So I'm not saying we mess with formal, I'm just saying open your mind to make sure that the influences that surround you. How do I know? Let me, let me give you some Bible. Paul says to Timothy, I know the faith that lied inside of your grandmother Lois and, and, your, and now is inside of you. Stir it up. He didn't say stir up the faith that 
Jesse gave him. He didn't. No, he said, stir up the faith that your mother and your grandmother instilled inside of you. So don't ever tell me that discipleship comes one directional. God is in the business of using the entire body of God to move and act and behave in such a way that we might be changed and transformed. So don't miss your moment. Not recognizing when there's spiritual maturity surrounding you. Not tapping into knowledge. You think you know it all. You don't know nothing. You're trying to figure out your wife. You better ask an older woman. <laughs> She's about 55. Go ask a 75-year-old what's happening when she's 55. You might figure out why them sheets getting thrown off in the middle of the night. Yeah, you better, man, get a half size blanket and call it a day. That's what you <laughs> Ladies, am I testifying? I'm telling you now, come on. You want to know why he just spent $700 on a car? No, you, listen, go ask the brother. What is it like when you hit 55, 60, you look back over your life, you think, hmm, my son rises a few into my son's like, God, then I might want to wake up in the morning and have a little energy, a little testosterone. If it looked like a four by four, then leave a the man alone. <laughs> yeah. Brother, y'all can thank me later. Now, don't go broke doing it, I'll be clear. <laughs> don't be missing no mortgage payments. Because you can't sleep in that truck. Well, you can, but she ain't. <laughs> you got to learn this faith in this word of God and make it a discipline of your life. And so when you're asking yourself the question, check the market. Can you go back to that side for me? Is learning and teaching the faith. Let's say this together. One, two, three. <laughs> a way of life or a thing we do. It's gotta be a way of life. It can't be just a thing you do. You can't be waiting for somebody to make, no, no, you got the same Holy Spirit. Lo, I am with you, even to the end that that's with you. Stir it up. Last thing he says is you got to lead. You got to learn to lead. Matthew 4, 19. Come and follow me, Jesus says. And I will send you out to fish for people. Many of you know it says come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Yeah. This idea of leading, you got to lead a life that says you are disciples. And then you've got to lead others to a deeper faith and a walk with God that says you're discipling. Now the reality is you're not discipled until you are discipling others. Don't anybody get it twisted. You can pass any class, get through any track, and get all the certificates. On the measure of God, you are not discipled until you are discipling others. That doesn't mean you need to lead a group until you actually have embedded and sold your life into someone else and led them to the place where they come to a deeper walk with God, you're really not, there is no real evidence of the mark of discipleship. Amen. Come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I knew it was gonna get quiet. <clears throat> I knew it, I knew, because, because it's a challenge. Sometimes you barely feel like you're getting through your own life, and now you're talking about go get somebody else. <laughs> I mean, real, I got a hard enough time <laughs> with me and mine, and you want me to go. <clears throat> Any people in here, you fishermen? I'm not really, I've only been fishing a few times. I'm not really, I know Reverend Barnes. It, all y'all fishermen, y'all raise your hand. There you go. That moment when you get a catch, like all, you wait all day long, it's in the hot sun, you on that boat, you done got seasick. <laughs> the bait is getting warm and it's getting a little crazy and, but that moment, yeah. boom, yeah. when it hits, it's like, whew, yeah. it's worth the whole thing. You know, ladies, like when you walk to the department show and you see that pair of shoes, you know you, that's the one. That moment where it's like, ugh. We all got those kind of ugh moments. 
You know, if you play a sport, it's that moment where you. There's a pleasure to discipleship that God wants you to experience. That moment where you connect with someone that you know is only because of God. It's an anointed moment where he's called you into someone's life. And as you walk with them, and it may be your son or daughter, maybe your next door neighbor, maybe a friend you met here at church. It may be someone that was in your formal disciple. But it, you figure this out, that you are going to be entwined with each other all the days of your life because God fits you together, not in friendship, but in discipleship. If you haven't experienced that, you don't want to get to heaven and not have had that moment. <clears throat> and I know you might think, you know, I'm a little crazy. I guess it's always somebody crazier than you. It's, it's somebody, God got a way of making it all come together. But the deeper you go, that idea. Listen to what T.J. English says. <clears throat> I believe the greatest opportunity for the contemporary church as a recapture of the radically God-centered vision for discipleship. Deep discipleship is about reveling, say that, reveling, reveling, in the transcendence of God. It is more than a ministry practice. Reveling is the idea of taking intense pleasure in something. Deep discipleship is about taking intense pleasure in seeing God transcend so if you've ever walked with someone and you see their life change and transform, there's something about that, not because you get glory, because God gets glory. You're in discipling them to you. You're discipling them to the one who brought you. And as a result of that, there's deep evidence. Listen, this world is crying out for discipleship. There are people who are in debt. Listen, everybody run into a therapist. Some of them folks need a discipler. You don't, it is a, you need someone who will walk you through to the grace of God that you might understand. And I'm not saying that people don't need, everybody needs somebody to talk to, but sometimes you need to talk to somebody who's talking to the one. Who's got all power in his hand. Let's say it together. Is leading a life of discipleship. A way of life or a thing we do. One, two, three. <laughs> Told you that was loving, leading, learning, leading. Seven things that you can measure as marks. There's lots of other marks you can use. These were seven I wanted you to kind of have. Ones that stuck out to me as I walked through the scriptures. Begins with your ability to worship God, give him credit for all things in your life, to love others because God has called you to do that, to make the sacrifice of forgiveness and love. That's what God is saying. It's also to have faith, to deepen your actual faith in God, to share your faith with others and to study your faith. That's the idea of learning. So loving and learning and leading lead a life that demonstrates that you've been disciple. That's how you act and behave before men and others and then make disciples as you draw people closer to God and use that as a demonstration of your life. And God gives us this guarantee. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He enacts the entire Godhead and the principles of discipleship and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And here's a promise, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I don't care how you did on the test today. Jesus gives you a guarantee. In this quiz, no matter how you did on the marks, you can't fail because all authority has been given to me. He says, listen, you better understand the type of authority that Jesus has. Jesus has power of choice and liberty type of authority, which means when God gave him authority, he can make any decision he wants to make. He has all authority. He has crowned authority, which means he's got authority that has been placed upon him that can't be, when they put that crown on the queen, she is the sovereign of the nation. He is a sovereign of the universe. He's got 
that kind of authority. He says, all of that authority I'm giving to you so what? That you might go and make disciples. It doesn't matter how you did. You know the guy who's marking the quiz. He's got a little thing that says, listen, I got cheat sheets for you. In fact, not only do I have cheat sheets, I got tutoring after class, office hours whenever you want. In fact, my office hours are 24 hours a day. Every minute you got, you can call on me and ask me, how am I going to handle this? Jesus has got all authority. He Listen, he's got universal authority, which means it doesn't matter where you are in the world or what situation you find yourself in. He's got all authority wherever he is. Why? Because he's the omniscient one, the all-present one, the all-powerful one. He was there before you got there. He's going to be there when you leave. That's the kind of authority. Jesus has got authorities over all subjects, which means anybody that's around you, you need to tell them what to do so that you might be. He got that. I give command. He says, listen, who is this man that the winds and the seas obey? All authority has been given onto him that you might go and make disciples. And lay I'm with you, even to the ends of the earth. So when you get a little weak in your faith, that's all right. He got all authority. When you get a little scared, all authority. When you don't know how you're going to handle tomorrow, all authority, because you know the one who holds tomorrow. So tomorrow when you wake up, go into this life with all authority. All authority. All authority. Is in his name. Church, say amen. Amen. Eternal God, we love you for who you are and all that you've done in our lives. That you would give us grace, amazing grace. It blesses us, oh God. So we've heard your word, and there are those today who may not know you. Would you make this the moment of salvation? that they might surrender their will to you and give their very lives. Some of us need to make some changes and transformations in our lives. Lord, help us to be strong enough to commit your word and your way to our lives that we might surrender once again our will in every area. If you'll do that, we'll glorify you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Church, say amen. 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 You may be here today and um. <clears throat> You don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the moment where we offer you the opportunity to enter into that. The one thing God will never do is take your will. You've got to surrender your will to him. He's giving you the choice to accept him. So in the moment, I'm going to ask everyone to stand. We have two things we'd like you to do. If you're online or at home, if you want to come forward, I'll lead you in a prayer, and you'll surrender your life, and you'll become a believer in Jesus Christ. You'll begin your journey as a Christian. The other person, you need a church home. This is not a perfect church. This is a great church to come and grow in your faith. You come also, and I'll pray with you as you become a member of this church. Saints, if you would stand and you would pray as that one today, I want to give my life to Christ. Would you come? I want to join this church. I want to give my life to Christ. You come. Don't waste time and don't play with God. Is there one? I want to give my life to Christ today. I want to join this church today. Eternal God, we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives and in this place. Now bless us as we leave this place that we might glorify you in all that we do. Now on to the one who is able to keep you from falling, to the one who will present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, be all glory, majesty, dominion, and power, and all who receive the blessing say amen. 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 God bless you.